Hi, how are you all doing today? I'm Kim Tavares. I'm the Executive Director of the Miami University Alumni Association, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Winter College 2021. Like most things this past year, this is not our typical Winter College program. Instead of being warm in your home or office, you would be on location somewhere warm, we always hoped it was gonna be warm, with Miami <laughs> alumni, faculty, and staff for a weekend of engaging presentations, thoughtful discussions, and plenty of Miami and social time. So we are excited to be able to offer Winter College virtually to keep this 17 year tradition going. Never heard of it before? That's okay, we're glad you're here. There are more than 500 registrants for this weekend, most with more than one person viewing. So we're gonna be continuing to offer our engaging presentations, our thoughtful discussions, and we've even been able to throw in some social time. You can navigate the full schedule by clicking on the upcoming events button under your video screen. And feel free to join the programs even while they're in progress. Can't make it to all of them? That's okay too. Sessions are recorded and posted online. The only exception is tonight's social event, which is full and will not be recorded. So let's get started. And have I got an amazing panel to get us going for these few days. Joining me today are three of Miami's most recent additions to the academic leadership. <laughs> Dr. Jason Osborne has served as Miami's Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs since August 2019. He most recently served as Dean of the Graduate School and Associate Provost for Graduate Studies at Clemson University, and prior to that served as a faculty member at the University of Louisville, University of Oklahoma, North Carolina State University, and Old Dominion University. He is a prolific and widely cited scholar in applied statistics and education. Dr. Jenny Derrick joined Miami University in July 2020 as Dean and Mitchell P. Rails Chair in Business Leadership and Professor of the Farmer School of Business. Prior to coming to Miami, she was Dean of the Peter F. Drucker and Masatoshi Ito Graduate School of Management at Claremont Graduate University in Claremont, California. Dean Derrick has authored three books, including Why Marketing to Women Doesn't Work, mm -hmm. Using Market Presentation to Identify Customer Needs. Mm -hmm. And our last panelist today is Dr. Bina Sukumaran. She became the Dean of Miami's College of Engineering and Computing in August, 2020. She previously served as Vice President for Research at Rowan University in Glassboro, New Jersey. And while at Rowan, she was Principal Investigator of a $1.92 million National Science Foundation grant titled Revolutionizing Engineering Diversity, which looked at various strategies to enhance the diversity and the success of the student population. Provost, and Dean Derrick, and Dean Sukumran, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to go ahead and get us started with some questions, but our live viewers can submit questions or comments during the session today by deciding, by clicking the ask a question button underneath your video screen. Okay, so again, thank you all for being here so much. I just read very formal, very impressive bios on each of you. Um, so what did we miss? What maybe could you tell us that that bio didn't include? Um, maybe a little bit about your background or where is home or, um, you know, where was one of the favorite places you lived? Academics move around a lot. <laughs> so tell us a little something personal for the group. And then I think they'd all love to hear what ultimately brought you to Miami. Um, Jenny, how about we start with you? No, so I'm a New Zealander. I came to the US in 2004, but I'm a dual citizen of each country. But New Zealand will always be home. I, I think New Zealand's in my bones. Both of our adult sons live in New Zealand and three of my four siblings are there. The other lives and works in Singapore designing casinos. In case you're wondering, I do love a good game of rugby and I especially enjoy the start of a game when New Zealand team performs and does the haka, which is a Maori challenge. I am sorry, Bina, but I do not much like cricket. <laughs> <laughs> One day, <laughs> one day <laughs> might be okay, but a five-day day test, I'd rather watch paint dry than watch a five-day test of cricket. So I, I came to Miami because I was ready for a challenge after 16 years at the Drucker School, and I wanted to join a university that had a distinct point of difference in the market. I found that here and more. Great. I'm thrilled to be here, so thank you. Thank you. Bina, after she threw down the challenge on cricket there, what else do you, what do you like to tell us about so, you and why you came to Miami? Yeah, so, so just to give you a background on uh, about myself, I feel like I'm a displaced person because I grew up in Malaysia and then 
did part of my schooling in Malaysia and then India and then came to the U.S. I think the longest I've been in any place is in the U.S. So I do think of it as home. So I've been in the U.S. now for 30 years. I've worked in, uh, I should, I, I think I've worked in various continents now. I've worked in Asia, Europe, uh, uh, you know, United States, well, North America, and then Australia as well. Uh, so, and, and for Jenny's challenge, I do love a game of cricket. I like the one-day games, not yeah. the five-day games, uh, but I love soccer. So that oh, was my yeah. favorite. <laughs> yeah. And Jason, I mean, we have no idea what they're talking about as Americans <laughs> or, or rugby. So tell us a little bit about yourself and why you came to Miami. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, thank you. And I'm so delighted to be here today with, with these two great teammates. Um, I, I come from upstate New York originally, so that does seem like a foreign world to some people. But for those of us who are familiar with Oxford, Ohio, um, it would look very familiar. And so um, I feel very privileged to be here. My journey has been uh, quite a long one. I think if uh, you're counting, this is my sixth institution. And I'm just trying to stay one step ahead of the pitchforks and the torches at the gate. So that's why I keep moving so often. But, um, you know, w once you all hear a little bit more from these two great deans, you'll see one of the blessings of being at Miami is having a great leadership team, great colleagues. And so, uh, boy, it's it's been a great 18 months so far. It's been challenging, um, but I'm glad I'm here. That's wonderful. I'm glad you're all here. And I just love how it highlights the the breadth of experience and diversity that faculty members at Miami have. So thank you all. Jason, I'm going to go to you for the first question here, because I know it's a big question um, on minds of our viewers and, and something you've been dealing with, obviously, a lot. Um, how, tell us a little bit about where we are as a university with COVID um, and how, how is the university responding? How's the spring semester going? Yeah, well, thanks for that question. Um, it is, we were just reminiscing um, just over a year ago, uh, or almost a year ago, that we shut everything down. And, um, and at that time, we thought this was going to be a two or four week issue. Um, it's turned into much more of a marathon than a sprint. Um, and it's been a challenge to a very traditional university in that we, from semester to semester, or sometimes even day to day, have been reinventing how we do things. And this is an example, certainly, of how we're continuing to innovate and to uh, take our game to different levels um, as an opportunity rather than a challenge. So um, the, the spring semester, last spring, obviously, we shut everything down mid-semester, a lot of upheaval. We were very optimistic for the fall semester, planned for a very a typical fall semester and ended up having five weeks of remote um, or online classes while we uh, implemented some very good testing and uh, contact tracing strategies. And then we had uh, some ups and downs if you've been following the, the cases uh, through the fall semester, but um, we've been innovating. Our faculty and staff have been leading us through a very challenging time and um, I, many universities are looking to us in terms of how we're doing testing, how we're looking at residence halls, how we're keeping our faculty and staff as safe as possible mm -hmm. during this time. So that brings us to the spring semester. Um, obviously, we were hoping for a less crazy semester. Um, we planned for a balanced semester in that uh, we, we still are operating under Ohio and CDC guidelines that require us to maintain six feet of distance in the classrooms and uh, obviously other safety procedures like masks and uh, and hand washing and et cetera. So that limits how much on-campus uh, activities and classes we can have. But currently we're at about a 50-50 ratio of on-campus to online. And um, that's about what many good universities are at. We don't have the infrastructure to have 100% of our classes on campus and distanced at the same time while we keep everyone safe. So um, I I'm very proud of that. Our faculty have really risen to the challenge. And you may be wondering how our students are doing. So we've been doing several things. We've been monitoring course evaluations, GPA. Um, we get every semester from students, they're able to nominate 
faculty for commendations and, and so on. And when we compare year over year for GPA, our students are actually doing higher or better with grades this semester as opposed to the last fall. Uh, I'm sorry, fall 20 versus fall 2019. The same was true for spring of 20 versus spring of 2019. And it looks like my camera froze. Can you can you all still hear me? We can still hear you. I have so um, I'll see if if that fixes it. If not, um, I'll keep talking. Um, so our student course evaluations also. Uh, well, I think we're there for a minute. So I'll tell you what, we will come back to Jason when he gets back to us. And we'll go ahead and jump into the next set of questions, which were for the two of you. So, <laughs> um, so Jenny and, and Vita, you know, Jason's talking about operating a university during the middle of a, a pandemic. You you started brand new jobs <laughs> in key areas in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you guys were even roommates, as I understand yeah. it, for a little bit when you came to Oxford. Yes. <laughs> so tell me about the challenges, but also maybe the opportunities of coming into your role you know, during this time. I think, you want to start? Yeah, oh, Bina, you go, please go, you start. Oh. No, that's okay, <laughs> okay. please go ahead. So, yeah. so it's the so, roommate thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I personally am not a person that would pause and really give it too much thought because there's so much to do and I'm not that kind of personality that would just, you know, think of the challenges, but let me talk a little bit about the challenges. So I interviewed here just over a year ago, and it's the last time I've actually seen Jason in person, and it's the last time I've been in the farmer school when the building's been filled with students. And, I, and I'll come back to that during the interview in terms of how much we've achieved as a school and as a university, and I'm in awe, actually, about how much we've done. But it, just to throw in some sort of finer grain details about the move, you know, putting a house on the market, uh, packing up a house, moving to Oxford, Ohio, when I wasn't willing to fly across to look at property to live in. And that's how I became a roommate with Bina. And we, we as you can tell, we do get on quite well. We've become quite good friends. <laughs> and so early on, when we were both appointed, uh, we got on Zoom calls and we'd just be comparing notes about, you know, all, all, of, all the things we compare notes about. And Bina, I think, I think she was serious she said well if you need somewhere to live you of could course. come and move <laughs> i think she meant it and so <laughs> yes i did uh, yeah, no, you didn't. i'm just teasing and so we, we continued with these wonderful conversations and then a couple of a couple of them later i said to bina is that offer still on the table and that's how i ended up moving in with bina and we just had a wonderful two weeks together and and my fondest memories were sitting over beautiful meals that bina cooked and we'd sit there and we'd laugh and we'd compare notes about our histories and 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 just life in general and we just we developed such a great friendship and I know you will talk about the academic partnerships that have come out of that relationship but as I said you know I'm grateful that I'm here I think it's a wonderful university I'm really proud of what we've done as a university and thrilled about the future but you know I I, I don't think I'll dwell on last year too much actually <laughs> as we continue to move forward so, Dina, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, for sure. You know, um, I didn't even anticipate that I would be moving. Uh, so I came to Miami because it really appealed to me as an institution. And I even yesterday, I think I was writing something. And I can tell you, I still have the code of love and honor on my table. And that gives me chills when I read through that. Uh, because it just talks about, and, and I can tell you, all these folks on screen, as well as our other folks on campus, as well as our students, alumni, I think they embody that, you know, that code of love and honor. And I talk about our leaders being servant leaders. And I think of myself along those lines. So in terms of challenges, of course, the same challenges that Jenny faced in terms yeah. of moving amidst a pandemic, not knowing that, you know, uh, that I'm coming to the Midwest. I, uh, I did uh, go to school in the Midwest, but I haven't lived here for a long time. And I made New Jersey my home for 23 years. So that was, you know, that was a difficult move, uh, mm -hmm. leaving friends and um, and that region behind. Uh, but, but the opportunities are immense, right? So when I came on board, I can tell you the first thing that we did, we didn't even have a tagline for our college. So I thought, 
what captures us? And it was such a great exercise that we went through with our uh, team of professionals, our faculty, staff, students, et cetera. And we came up with IQ, imagination, ingenuity, impact. And we think that is what the college stands for. You know, so, so I'm very excited. And then when I think about the opportunities that are available, and, and this is uh, National Engineers Week. So, you know, it's a special time for us as engineers and computer scientists. And I'm extremely passionate about my profession. So I right. will talk about that later. But, you know, okay. but I just think there's just so many opportunities. That's great. And I know that you two have really, in this situation, have just hit the ground running. And Jason, that's where we found it was a, a good time to pick up with them. We had some technical difficulties there to just ask how they've been adapting to these new positions um, over the last few months. And I know that's what we were in process and progress of hearing from you. So if you wanna go back to where you were talking about our students and how they're faring right now. Sure, I, I apologize for that, um, that little issue. Uh, hopefully it's resolved, but um, I'm, I'm also happy to uh, ha listen more and talk less because our deans are really impressive leaders. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing that I just wanted to reinforce is that um, our students, you know, they're, they understand that this is an unusual time. Um, they're giving our faculty and our staff and our university a lot of grace and maturity. They're responding with maturity. Our faculty have really risen to the challenge. They've completed something like 8,000 professional development hours between May and now, um, trying to make sure that they're the best they can be. Obviously, we're dealing with budget challenges, but the more important thing as you listen to our deans and other leaders is that we're not just holding on. We're not just trying to cling to what little we can. We're really trying to innovate during this time. And so uh, we have a strategic plan that I received when I arrived a year and a half ago that we're executing on. We have our Boldly Creative Initiative, which now has gone through four rounds where we're, in, we're investing in new programs, we're investing in new ideas that will carry us through a renaissance, hopefully as we come out of COVID and really position Miami to be extremely successful. Um, and differentiated from other top universities. Um, I hope when our deans uh, take the floor again, they'll talk about some of the initiatives they're excited about. But I can tell you that we're, we're implementing a, a lot of uh, graduate programs that will help differentiate us. We're continuing to innovate in the undergraduate space. We're doing some, in Oxford, some select online programs to reach audiences that we've never reached before. We, uh, this fall, will have a new honors college for the first time, a residential college that's housed on Western campus that uh, is getting a tremendous amount of interest. We've had uh, something like 4,600 students apply for 400 slots for this fall. Uh, we're redoing our Global Miami plan to continue to innovate in that space. And so all of these things together, um, just I, I hope one of the takeaways for you today is that um, you're seeing that we're not standing still, we're continuing to try to live our values and really innovate. Um, for fall, I just wanna note that currently my outlook is that we'll be fully back on campus, not how it was before, but um, of the same nature. We'll be back on campus doing even better things, mm -hmm. learning from all this, um, this pandemic time and uh, continuing to move forward. That's great news to hear, obviously, for all of us. We're very excited by that prospect. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, you know, it has been a really exciting time on campus, even if we're only virtually there, some of us. Um, you know, you struck me about the differentiation, and that was something we talked about before when we were meeting to plan this panel, is that Jenny and Bina are really trailblazers in what is mostly a male-dominated mm -hmm. profession. Um, and they're acknowledged thought leaders as well. And so um, Jason, who is our statistics person here, did a little figuring and, and I think we determined that only about 25% of top business schools are run by a woman and only 17% of the top engineering programs have women who are the deans. And so the fact that Miami has you both here, I think that puts us in this, what was it, about a 4% or 4.25? You were pretty specific there with your probability there. Also known as double trouble, I believe. Um, which is great. <laughs> but I thought, how interesting to see, um, you know, fields that have been traditionally male-dominated, mm -hmm. the two coming on together, 
to lead these areas. You know, tell us a little bit. So our alums who are watching, who you know were undergraduate business and engineering and computer majors, how have things changed for the students today? Um, you know, since you and our alumni were students, what do student, students need to know now that maybe back then students in those fields didn't? Um, and maybe give some specific examples to each area, you know, how you're meeting these challenges. I, I think if I if I start, you know, when I went to college, we'd, we'd walk into a lecture hall, we'd, you know, it was that stage on the stage model, we'd be talked at, we'd leave the lecture hall, we'd be on our own. I don't think I even figured out where the business school was for quite, perhaps even the first year, I'm not quite sure. And, and, and faculty were very unapproachable. And I think the thing I love about the Farmer School in Miami is how we absolutely take student success seriously. It's a, at the heart of everything we do. Our teachers, I, our faculty are fantastic teachers I knew that but now I'm seeing it firsthand and I just see the commitment that they have to our students and student success and I see how much time they put into the classroom so so one of the things that that is important and it's important for many reasons is to provide engagement and plenty of opportunities for students to engage but equally important is what we call experiential learning ample opportunities for students to take what they're learning in the classroom and apply it to practice and employers expect that of our students now they don't just want technical skills they they also speak of the soft skills that they're looking for in, in mm -hmm. our students and we have a lot of curricular and co-curricular activities in place to take care of that. So I think the other um, interesting data point is that we're number three in the country of, of publics for the number of students who have internships before they graduate. And I think that's a telling data point as well, because employers expect our students to hit the ground running. They're expecting that of our students. They, they, they want students to be well prepared. And I think we do that without question. We do that very, very well here. Most definitely. Bina, what about you? Yes, yeah, so our profession is all about, uh, I mean, it is a professional field, right? They are going out into the real world, so they have to learn by doing. So we do believe in that project-based learning approach. And even amidst this pandemic, I mean, our faculty have engaged in that process. They have made their labs uh, I mean, they have allowed students to be in the labs physically, or we are allowing mm -hmm. remote logins to help them uh, engage in that process. They, we also make all our students go through a senior capstone, which is a year long process where they work on a real life uh, design problem with faculty as guides. Uh, but this is something that they take on and where they put all their knowledge together. And, and same thing, you know, very similar to what Jenny alluded to, our students have either an internship or they have worked with 100% of our students have either an internship or they have worked with a faculty member on research based on their interest level by the time they graduate. And, and we have, you know, placement rates that are very impressive um, because the job market is pretty strong in our area. Uh, but I have to commend our faculty for being able to do what they, uh, you know, what they're doing right now, because you know, lots of them are juggling personal challenges as well as uh, the professional commitments, and they have really come through. And they put the students first. Mm. That is their primary interest. You know, that is who they're focused on, and they want them to succeed, and they don't want them to have a lesser experience. Uh, even amidst the spending. No, and, and you know, you're, to your point, our faculty are definitely something that stands out um, among other schools, and then our alumni remember that as well. You know, while this year we had classes that went virtual that were not intended to be that way, it also presented an opportunity for us to put some programming out there, specifically in the virtual environment. And one of those things was the mini MBA program that. Um, Jenny, Jason, and I coordinated on, and it was wildly successful. Um, I think more than any of us could have imagined. <laughs> and, and I think it's because alumni really have, they want that connection back with those faculty members. They remember that from their undergraduate time. So Jason um, just wanted to know what, can you give us a little teaser about the future of 
specific um, you know, courses that are designed to be delivered online for Miami. That's not something we've done traditionally, but it looks like we're starting to get into that field a little bit more. Uh, we are, and uh, I would in, invite our deans to talk about what's going on in their particular uh, units. But you know, in general, so we have we have kind of a bifurcated operation. We we have the the residential uh, campus in Oxford, and then the regional campuses have already realized that a lot of their students they don't they either aren't able to or or don't want that kind of experience and so they for many years have been pivoting into more online degree programs and um, they have uh, quite a number of online undergraduate degree programs and um, excitingly they will also have graduate programs uh, for nurses uh, that will be online so we'll have three master's programs and a doctoral program um, and so uh, in Oxford we're also looking at you know we're very far away from some population centers, but we have incredible things that we can offer. So how do we navigate that? And of course, during pandemic times, some of these things, some of the degree programs are being designed to be fully online. And in some cases, we may take uh, the program on the road and go to a population center and deliver them in person. So we're just starting that process, but we have um, some uh, business degree programs that are uh, expected to be online in the, in the master space. Uh, we have some education programs in the master space. Uh, we so one of the things that um, I haven't spoken a lot about, but is a point of pride, is our esports program. Mm -hmm. So for uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with esports, uh, the the video game world has become a competitive space yeah. now, and President Crawford is the is the head of um, our esports league uh, that in, includes many different uh, universities. And uh, our team is one of the top ranked in the nation. And so we're leveraging that with a really interesting, uh, several interesting degree programs, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, where uh, students can learn the business and the artistry of esports and, and uh, online gaming and things like that. So there's a lot coming, there's a lot more in the pipeline. We're really innovating in this space for the future. I got a 13 year old is very interested in that idea of Jason already. So Vina, what about, what about in the engineering school? Where are you guys looking for online? Yeah, we are looking at the graduate level, uh, similar to what Jason mentioned. So we actually do have some programs that were funded through the Boldly Creative uh, Initiative that will be offered on one, online. So some examples, automation and industrial manufacturing. So these are stackable credentials. Uh, these are stackable graduate credentials. Uh, we are in a manufacturing area. You know, if you look at the Midwest, it is the hub for manufacturing. So we think it is critical to have this. Another one that we have that is uh, being developed right now is a master's degree in clinical engineering. So this is for uh, engineers to uh, function in a hospital setting. Uh, because especially in light of the pandemic, uh, you know, we realize that there's a need for that. Because if you think about lot, lots of the challenges that we are facing, even with vaccine distribution, vaccine production, it all comes down to engineering. And in some ways, you know, uh, the logistical challenges. So, and if you look at a hospital capacity, right, we couldn't ramp up fast enough or we couldn't ram down. So, so how do we get engineers in those settings who can help with that? How do we get the instrumentation in place? So this will be a program. In fact, it will be one of three in the nation uh, that we will have. So we are leaders in this uh, area because you know we have faculty with that expertise who are leading on that front. But most of that coursework will be offered online. And uh, except for where we need that hands-on lab experience, then and we are trying to consolidate that so that you know they come in for a compressed time period because right. the, we know that this is an area. I mean, this will be folks from industry, some of them who will be participating. So we want to give those options as well. So those are just two examples of the things. That's fantastic. That yeah, really exciting. 
Jenny, what about in the business school? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on the MBA and then I'll talk about our graduate programs. So I'm glad that you gave a shout out to the mini MBA, Kim. <laughs> and we're thrilled with how that went. And I was just looking at numbers. Six and a half thousand alumni signed up to take it and nearly 2,000 students signed up to take it during the J term. So what that's showing us, there's an, an appetite for lifelong learning among our alum. There's a willingness to participate in what we do. And we are in the process of trying to monetize that now. We realize we've got quite a good product on our hands and we're in discussions with several organizations to offer either the existing mini MBA or an expanded version of it. So that's one opportunity right there. And the faculty who got involved absolutely loved uh, producing the modules for that. Moving on to graduate degrees, we've got a bunch of things going on, as Jason alluded to. We're really excited about what we're doing with graduate degrees. Uh, we're currently working on the PMBA. We're taking that online. And the MSIM. Now, the MSIM is a new class of degrees, not for the states particularly. It's not so uh, common. But it's a one-year general man core management. I don't general management is the wrong term. It's the core management curriculum that you'd find in an MBA, and it's really designed for a couple of different audiences. A primarily, it's designed for people who are slightly less experienced, for whom an MBA is not quite the right degree, and who can come and take a core of management to bolt it on, say, to an engineering degree, or to an English degree, or a psychology degree, or maybe um, your know, biology, or something like. That so they can end up with different job outcomes. So it's a very, very nicely designed degree, and we're in production at the moment. The other one I want to give a shout out for is an undergrad program, a certificate in the fundamentals of analytics, and we're in production for that right now with a launch date of, of May. And as, as you understand, that so much is changing in the world of work that we are looking to add on analytics to many subject matters so students have different outcomes. So a huge lineup. We're just really excited about what we're doing. And uh, to Jason's point, this is new for us. It's a newer market for us. Uh, we're heavily involved in ramping up and marketing uh, pr production, but really excited about the opportunities that, that lie ahead. That's great. And, and, you know, Jenny, the analytics thing in particular was something I wanted to ask you about as, um, as a question here. Uh, obviously, the number one major in the business school and in one of the top majors in the university for many years running at the undergraduate level is finance. Um, I was going to ask you to tell me why Miami does so well in this field. Um, so we'll talk about that. But then, you know, you mentioned it yourself, business analytics um, of the prospective 8,500 students who applied this year, 1,100 mentioned business analytics. And I think only a few years ago, there were only a couple of hundred. So it's a good finance is still, <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. Finance is still king right now. So why does Miami do so well there? And tell us about this business analytics and why there's been such an increase. Yeah, in oh, oh, I think that's a great, a great question. So I'll start with finance, of course, and lead into business analytics. But you know, we we firstly admit outstanding students to, to Miami and to the Pharma School. And these are students who know that we have a rigorous curriculum who can handle it. So I think we start with our students and the quality of our students. We have world-class research active faculty. And Bina and I know this, and Jason too, because we've just finished a round of promotion and tenure where we We've read through the dossiers, but impressive faculty who push the students to do extraordinarily well. They don't they don't take second. Uh, we also link students to the classroom from the classroom to practice, and we've talked about that in our answers. And we have programs in place that also develop soft skills. So we've got the complete package going on in what we're doing. So what we turn out are graduates who are outstanding and add value to organizations from day one. And that's that's the beyond really tagline that we use, is that they hit the ground running and they add value. So in a way, it's not really surprising that we launch a business analytics degree and we get over a thousand people registering. And I think to me when I think about why would that be and, and of course it's a newer area for most universities but I think the reason that we're doing so well with this early interest is that we have a strong brand promise so people know that if they come to the pharma school if they come to Miami University there's a brand promise that, as I outlined for finance that, that applies to business analytics and I can tell you that we've got an incredible curriculum I've been really really impressed by what I see and by how contemporary the curriculum is and also the point of view that's 
that's taken with the faculty is to not just teach business analytics, but to encourage our students to have a subject matter expertise that they can know how to interrogate data and what mm -hmm. questions to ask of the data to help solve management problems. So I'm not surprised, but it's a, it's a good problem to have. We're thrilled that business analytics is taking off so well. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how that how that shifts and grows over the next several years. So that's an exciting time for you as well. And and Bina, the engineering school has already kind of gone through this and then might be on the verge of doing this again. So I think um, computer science and mechanical engineering are your top right now, but that wasn't always the case. Um, that used to be the systems analysis was one of the largest majors there, if not just on campus. Um, so I kind of give you the same question. What does Miami do so well in the computer science and mechanical engineering that 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 continues to be the top area there? But you also have a new area showing a lot of interest, and that's robotics. Um, there have been classes offered in that, but I think the first cohort major is coming this fall. Is that correct? Um, as one of the only undergraduate robotic, robotic programs in the state. So um, again, what do we do well in, in our kind of good, the good ones that we've had there for a while and tell us about this new exciting um, program. So, so Kim, just to give you, uh, you know, what I hear from our employers about our students and our alumni is that what we do well, and this is not just for uh, computer and software engineering or mechanical and manufacturing engineering, is that because we have this liberal arts foundation that we build on, uh, so, so that is the foundation that we build our technical core on, right? So, so that makes our students special. Uh, so, so there aren't very many, uh, I would say, graduates like our students who are articulate, who can function in a complex organization, who have, uh, who are culturally competent, uh, you know. So, so this is the kind of graduate that we produce, right? And that is what makes them special. I just got a note yesterday, I think it was two days back from one of our uh, professors who retired and, and he was, I think, looking through the news and it was a company, a huge company that has moved to the Cincinnati area. And they said they decided to make Cincinnati their home because of the graduates mm -hmm. from Miami and University of Cincinnati uh, in our space, so in the technical area. So I think that is what makes us special. Uh, I have employers knocking on my door almost every day saying how can they be in front of our students so that they pick them as their first choice uh, so so we have several of them who have come knocking and and just to talk about the bs in robotics engineering yes we will be uh, one of the first in the state, well, the first in the state after we got approval. Uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, and what we realized is we are in this robotics corridor. I mean, between here and Detroit is where lots of the robotics jobs are. But what I see again, and this is one of the challenges we face within our discipline, is that uh, an 18-year-old might not know what a robotics engineer does, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I just posted an uh, event with incoming freshmen, uh, and I think, and I lose track of my days, uh, but I think it was two days back, and we had 100 students, and lots of the questions was around robotics engineering. There was lots of interest. Like, what do they do? What kind of jobs can they end up with, and so on. So, so we have to do a bit of education in our space as well to tell them what this degree will lead to. Right. Yeah. That's fantastic. And that it leads to a question that, that came in, um, and you kind of hit on it already, but, you know, talking about the current job market. And, um, you know, it's been a rough bit here for the recent grads um, and the current students who, you know, often rely on internships, mm -hmm. um, you know, to be able to get those jobs later. But, um, you know, Jason, I'll jump to you really quickly before I go over to the deans again. But, you know, Bina really hit on some key points about why Miami students stand out among other engineers. What do the liberal arts, uh, what does a liberal arts degree coming from a liberal arts college like Miami, um, how, does, how does that help the job seekers of today? What are the benefits there? 
Yeah, I, I suspect we're preaching to the choir with our alumni here because they they get it. Um, what you're getting is not only an, an exceptional professional preparation, but you're also getting that broad liberal arts background. So what that leads leaves you with is um, a really marketable set of skills, not only for that first job. So you can, we, uh, we talk about writing across the curriculum. You can communicate effectively with a variety of different audiences through a variety of different modalities. We talk about making sure we're culturally, uh, we have cultural um, consciousness so you can work in diverse teams. We, we talk about an entrepreneurial mindset. So regardless of what sector you're in, you're thinking creatively and problem solving. That creates a lot of demand from employers. So whether you're an accounting major, a nursing major, a teacher, education, engineering, um, or art, whatever it is, you're getting a lot of that background. And then you are not only ready for that first career move, but you're ready for the next opportunity that might not be something you anticipate. Like many of us, uh, not all of us anticipate being leaders in higher education or even working in the sector. And then you're ready for your first leadership opportunity. And then you're ready to do what's next. And so, um, I think when you look at not only our undergraduate uh, environment, but what we're adding on. So what um, Jenny was talking about with some of these plus one masters is, um, as President Crawford puts it, you can follow your passion and then you can also get these other degrees that prepare you for a broad range of opportunities. And that's a hallmark of a Miami student and a Miami education in a nutshell. Uh, when I look at our majors, if you look at our undergraduate degrees, um, about a fifth to a quarter of our students are double majors or triple majors. And they're not always doing finance and accounting or mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. They're chemical engineering and cello. They're theater and finance. And so they're they're really, you know, Renaissance students in a way that makes a lot of sense. And so that to me is is one of the reasons I wanted to be part of Miami. And I think a lot of students and employers come this way as well. I know I'm always so impressed when I hear students talk about all the different things that they're doing. And it's, mm. I think, do you sleep? How do you, how do you get all that done? Our students mm. do so much. Um, Bina and Jenny, what, um, what's, what's happening in each of your areas where you're helping your students um, at this point in time? You know, as I said, we're in maybe this era, this era of limited internships and jobs. And I think, you know, how can our alumni who are watching today, how can they help? So for us as a school, one of the three priority areas we've set is, is around student outcomes. And it's, and it's incredibly important to us. And outcomes are determined by starting salaries. They're determined by percentage who have a job at 90 days of graduation. And one of the important variables that feeds into that is having had an internship prior to, to graduation. So we, we've always done quite well with internships. 96% of our students have at least one int internship and over half have more than one. So we do well there, but we uh, let me share with you a data point. We did a survey of our graduating seniors in the winter term and 42% of them had a job offer, which is, is down quite a lot from where it should be. It's normally around high 60s, 70% at this time of the year. So we're not quite sure how to interpret that because we hear from employers different things. We hear maybe it's a later market, maybe the jobs might start trickling on when there's more certainty around the change in politics and the markets and so forth and COVID. It's just really hard to tell. But the fact of the matter is it's incredibly important to Miami University that our students are placed for lots of reasons. You know, of course, the return on investment on an education is, is hugely important to our students and their families, but so too is the reputation of the school and the university and placement and having good jobs, being employed in a profession you've trained for, help us maintain our reputation as a nationally ranked university. So my, my shout out to our alumni is if you are in a position to take on an intern or hire one of our graduates, please reach out through you know, to any one of us on this call and we'll get you to the right place because it's a really critical time of the year and, and we're a little bit cautious, a touch nervous about the job market, but I do, I do here, in fact, in the last week, we had at least one employer a day came to us, one with four jobs. So, so it's starting to come through. But as I said, it's just been a little bit slow and we just have to keep all hands on deck at this point to make sure that we, we provide the best possible outcomes for our students. 
That's fantastic. And, and Bina, I know you mentioned a little bit about the employers. Anything else specifically you'd like to add to that? No, uh, you know, and I don't have the statistics yet. I only have what we had from last year. I do know that most of our students with internships did continue uh, because I think we have all figured out how to do that remotely. So most of our students who did have internships, uh, they did keep them on the rolls. Uh, right. So they didn't lose the internships. We just had a career fair, uh, you know, on Wednesday. So I know the turnout from the companies was great. And uh, and lots of our students who are graduating this year already have job offers. But I don't have the data yet on mm. what percentage has job offers. So I wouldn't comment on that. Okay. What our alumni can do is definitely, you know, help us, right? Connect us. Uh, and, and they are doing that. I, I have to give a shout out to alumni. I mean, they are so willing to help. So we had one of our alumni, because I was on a call with him, he immediately connected to their global re recruiting lead. And this is for GE, uh, you know, saying, look, these are, let's make this connection and let's make sure that we are recruiting from IRA. So I would say, let's continue that. <laughs> And they can do that. We will ensure yes. that. So thank yes. you. So we have about 10 minutes left and we've got some questions that have come in. And so I'm going to start with some of those. Um, Bina, one specifically to you that I think is is perfect um, mm -hmm. is how do we get more women enrolled in the College of Engineering and Computing? And I'm just going to brag on you for a minute um, before you answer the question is that this is an area you have a passion behind because you were just recognized by women in engineering um, a proactive network inclusive culture and equity award. And it says for exemplary leadership in implementing programs that promote positive change to the climate and culture for women in engineering fields. Mm. <laughs> so congratulations to you and tell Thank us, you. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing to bring women into this field. So, so it, this is a persistent problem that we face nationally and as a profession. So if you look at Miami, we are at around 20% of our student body are women. Uh, so, so that is at the national average. That is what it is nationally. We can definitely do better. So some of the things that we're thinking of, we just hired a person uh, who is an assistant director for outreach who will be working with the schools in the area. So we have to start early uh, because of some of the curriculum requirements, the math and science that's required. So we are thinking of programs that we can do from elementary through high school with these students, right? That they're thinking of engineering. Can we educate and uh, teachers who have an engineering background? So that is also critical so that mm -hmm. we are getting engineering out early on and that they're seeing the application. This is something that is of national concern as well, that uh, we are not producing enough engineers and computer scientists. So there is, uh, there have been lots of reports put out over the last two years that we are losing a competitive edge, right? So, mm -hmm. so when we have this uncapped resource of about 50% of our population, I think we have to do better. Mm -hmm. So some things that we can do at the college level, once they come in, is how do we create this climate that is inclusive of women, that values them. And we do do that right now, because in fact, our, stu our women students actually win lots of our awards <laughs> at the school. They graduate at a higher rate. Uh, they have higher GPAs when they graduate. So if they come in the door, they do succeed, but it's getting them in the door that that we are struggling with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of the admission strategies that we have in place right now, where we have done away with some of the standardized tests, I think it will help. But I think we have to do this education of what is possible with an engineering and computing degree and bringing it back. Because when we used to talk about the profession, it was always about the gadgets that we built. We never talked about the social impact of the profession. Mm -hmm. And the social impact of the profession is immense, right? Uh, mm -hmm. so, so, so when we talk about that, I think it just opens it up to a different population, which includes our women who are mm. underrepresented. In the mm. 
Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and staying kind of on the diversity level here for a minute, because Jenny, I know that the Farmer School of Business um, has a new Center for Diversity, Community and Belonging. And um, could you tell us a little bit about how that initiative is preparing and supporting all students? So, so just a slight clarification, it's more of an umbrella term that we're using to group together all of the activities that we have. But at the core of what we do, and you know, one of the challenges we all have at Miami is to bring in a more diverse student population. And when we speak of diversity at the school, we're not just speaking about race, we're speaking about sexual orientation, we're speaking about economic differences, first generation differences, uh, and gender differences has been talked about. So as I look across the school, I see a lot of activity that we do. And we have, for example, the passport program to bring in students from underrepresented minorities. Secondly, it's all very well bringing students into the school, but what do we do do when they're here to make them feel supported and at the heart of how I operate is to make sure that all of our students have an equal opportunity to have access to everything that we offer at the school so that they have an equal chance to succeed. So we're spending a lot of time talking about what that means. So one thing we've done is setting up a pod system for example and we're just experimenting with it now in spring but something we've been gravely concerned about is how students didn't feel connected through this current academic year. So what can we do about it? So we're setting up a pod system and, and oh. it's, it's about to launch through our student organizations. But the idea is that, you know, to really reach out and encourage all of our students to feel that they can be part of our community and participate. And then we have other programming things that we're really proud of, something we call CQ. And we introduced CQ in the first year integrated core, which is into its fifth year. So it's, it's roaring along and doing extraordinarily well. But it, that's about that's for all of our students to understand what it means to embrace difference and what does difference mean and how do we work with difference and difference that may not be obvious and so we're really working with our students to to, to, to get them to be more culturally aware about difference and effect, you know, at the end of the day our brand promise is to turn out beyond ready leaders and 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 to me it, it, it doesn't matter then what your demographic identifier is you you need to learn how to lead teams of diverse and different people to leverage the strengths from everybody because certainly all the research shows that the world is a better place if we're willing to embrace difference and 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 let different voices be at the table thank you and thank you for clarifying that you know this is an umbrella this is the way you're approaching <laughs> everything at the farmer sure. school the no and, and i just think that's so important to to make that clarification <laughs> and right. to understand that that's yeah. you know every everything is being approached under that at this point. well it's an umbrella term and i think partly because we've got so many activities going on mm -hmm. that fit into de and i and the reason we're using the term community and belonging at the, at the end isn't that what it's all about that we've built a community and everybody feels that they belong in that community and that's why we're using that terminology is our as our umbrella too that's fantastic and we've got one last question i think it's a great one to end on um it's for each of you jenny and bina where do you want to see your respective colleges in five years you go bina you go first. an easy one to end with <laughs> <laughs> where i would like to see my college i did set out some goals and one of the things that i did say is i would like us to be a leader in the education of women, underrepresented and tra traditionally underserved students in engineering and computing. And, and I know that's a tall order, but uh, I think it, that's possible. <laughs> that's a good one, Jenny. So the goal we've set for ourselves, we're currently ranked number 17th in the country for a public undergraduate business school. We've set ourselves a goal of being top 10 by 2025, and we're heading in a great direction. So there, there are three component parts. It's around admissions, it's around student experience, and it's around career outcomes. So that's the goal we've set for the school. Great. Well, we are out of time, but I want to thank the three of you so much for joining us today. I have had a wonderful experience working with each of you remotely for the most part, but soon we will get to do things together in person and engaging our alumni um, with all of the exciting things that you have going on in each of your colleges and with Miami overall. So again, thank you for your time today. Um, and thank you for those of you that tuned in. We have another session coming up at 1 p.m. Eastern time. It's the politics of vaccinations in the U.S. 
by College of Arts and Science professor Amanda McBeady. And just a reminder that there are unique URLs for each session. So please refer to your registration confirmation email, or you can check the um, view upcoming events button that's underneath your video player. On behalf of the Miami University Alumni Association, thank you for joining us today. Have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.